five. We're in Romans chapter five. One, three, four, five. Who knows? We're in <laughs> Romans chapter five. And again, we're just going to dive right in. It says, therefore. <laughs> and so the question you must ask yourself at this point is what? What's the therefore, therefore? And I'm just the therefore, therefore, and the therefore reminds us of, Ron, you mind shutting that door there? The word therefore reminds us of everything that we've uh, talked about thus far. Thus far, <laughs> thus far, thus far. And that's what the therefore is there for, to discuss what we've discussed thus far. Now, up to this point, uh, Paul has uh, basically divided our discussion up into three categories, which is basically three groups of people. In chapter 1, he talked about the Jew, the Greek, and the righteous man. He divides, uh, the, all the world can divide, be divided up into, the, into those three categories. Of course, the Jew, in our application, is the religious man. He's talking about the literal Jew of that day, but in our application, it's anyone who's trying to approach God through some sort of religious system. You know, follow these rules, keep this diet, do these things, and then you'll be blessed of God. That's the kind of attitude that Paul's talking about. Of course, the Greek is the, the Gentile, anyone who's not a Jew. He's, that's speaking of the worldly man. The worldly man is the man who's rejected God, and he's turning to the things of this world for satisfaction and fulfillment. It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It could be fame, fortune, money, anything of the world. He's turning to that because he's seeking satisfaction and fulfillment. And of course, the righteous man is a man who lives by faith. And so that's what we've seen this, thus far. In chapter 1, Paul talked about the Greek or the worldly man, the, the man who's seeking satisfaction and the fulfillment from this world. Then in chapter 2, he talked about the religious man, the, the religious man who is one that's trying to reproach, approach God through a religious system, specifically the Jew in this case. And then in chapters 3 and 4, he began to talk about the righteous man, how we should approach God based upon what he's done for us rather than what we can do for him. The righteous man, Paul says, shall live by faith. That's how we live. We live by faith. That faith is not in a religious system, but faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And, of course, the Jew is hearing this. And he's saying, about what about the law? What's the law there for? And, and Paul explains the law was simply to lead us, guide us, and direct us toward Christ Jesus. Then they, might have, then they might have said, well, what about our father Abraham? What about King David? And, and, and of course, Abraham, that's the, the father of the Jewish nation. He says even he was, believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. You know, and he explained how, you know, how uh, Abraham was circumcised 17 years after God had counted him righteous. He pointed out that Abraham existed 400 years before the law was even given. So Abraham was not considered righteous because he kept some sort of religious law. He was considered righteous simply because he believed in the promise of God. And then David also, a man after God's own heart. He may have been a man after God's own heart, but he was also a dirty, rotten scoundrel. You know, David was a man who committed adultery and tried to cover up that adultery with murder. And Paul pointed out what David had said. He says, blessed is the man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, he said. Blessed is the man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Not made up, not covered up by works or deeds or this, this kind of thing, but forgiven. So that's what the therefore is there for. Paul's pointing back to, to, uh, to all that has been said up to this point, And he's drawing it in to what he's about to say. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith. We're justified by faith, not by works. Faith in what Jesus has done. That's how we're justified. We put our faith in the sacrifice he's made. It's justified, never sin. That's how God views us. It's, we're justified in him. Through faith, in, uh, through faith by faith, I'm, I'm sorry, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have peace? You see, if you're not experiencing peace, it only, it, it only, it's an only an indication that you don't understand how you've been justified. 
And it's only an indication that you don't really grab a hold of the grace that God offers you today. Because if, you, if you've laid hold of that, then you should have a peace in your heart. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Because that your sin has been dealt with. You can approach God with a peace in your heart. Knowing that God has washed your sin away, cast as far from you as the east is from the west. That gives me a peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. He goes on to say, Through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. We, we stand in the presence of God. We don't sneak in. We don't dive in. We don't try to work our way in. No, we stand. We stand in the presence of God. This reminds me of the, the temple. You don't know, have to turn your amp back on there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Kept hearing a radio, and that, that amp picks up a radio signal. So, um, The temple could be divided. You walk into the temple. Hey, you got the golden lamp stand on one side as you walk in, and you have the table of showbread over here. There's the table of showbread right there. But anyway, we got the golden lamp stand, we got the table of showbread, and immediately in front of you would be the altar of incense. The priest would come in, and he'd go before the altar, and he'd offer up prayer on behalf of the nation. He'd offer up this prayer to God. And it would, it would rise up. This incense would rise up as a fragrant aroma. And that, that's how God views our prayers. It comes up to him as a, as a fragrant aroma. It's very pleasing to God when we pray. And so this, this, this altar of incense is right before this veil. Keep this in mind. This veil. This veil is one foot thick. Could you imagine fabric that's one foot thick? It's impossible to tear. You could take two four, four-wheel drives and try to pull this apart. It's not going to happen. It was enormous. It was 60 feet tall. It, it embroidered on this veil were these angels or these cherubim. This cherubim was upon the veil. And, 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 uh, this is what divided the holy place where the golden lampstand was, and the, the table of showbread, and the, the altar of incense. This is what divided the room. And on the other side of this, this veil, this veil that was one foot thick and, and 60 feet tall, was the Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant, of course, was the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and a jar of manna that um, was placed there by Moses. So the, 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 this is the Holy of Holies. And right here, the priest would come in and only once per year could the priest go beyond that veil? And he had to go through all kinds of ceremonial cleansing before he could go beyond that veil. He had to confess every single sin that he ever committed. Every single sin had to be accounted for before he could go beyond that veil. And, and this is what they started doing. They started tying a rope around his ankle because many times the priest would go in beyond that veil and he would die in the presence of God. So they tie a rope because no one wanted to go in there and get his dead body because they too would die. So they would drag him out with that rope. But here's the deal. When the priest did go in there, he had to sneak around the veil. He had to come around the veil in order to get into that Holy of Holies. We don't have to do that. Because Matthew 27 tells us, when Jesus Christ was up on the cross of Calvary, just before he died, before he died, he uttered these final words. It is finished. The sin debt has been paid. And the moment he said that, we're told that the veil in the temple, this one foot fabric, foot thick fabric, was torn from top to bottom. In fact, the Bible says, from heaven to earth, you see. That veil was torn. Because you see, Jesus has made the way so that we can come into the presence of God and stand without a concern for sin. He's dealt with it. We can now stand in His presence. 
Because he's dealt with our sin. We're not going to die in his presence. Because Jesus has washed. He's that great high priest who had no sin. Who paid the sin's penalty for us so that we can stand in his presence. And I love this next part. And we exult in hope. We celebrate in hope. Because now we've got this hope of heaven. We can celebrate because Jesus has dealt with our sin. We can now go into the presence of God and experience heaven. All the riches there are in Christ Jesus. We now have hope. Now, when we talked about this last week, oftentimes when we think of hope, we say, well, I sure hope I get to heaven, as if it's not a certainty, you see. But that's, that's not hope. Hope is the, is the absolute expectation of a coming good. The absolute expectation. We have now have this absolute expectation. We have this hope of going into the presence of God, being in heaven for all eternity. Maybe this will give you a better idea of what hope is. Many years ago, they did this study on mice. They, they filled this tub full of water. And they put five or six mice in this tub. And they just let them swim around in there. These mice swam around about five or six minutes, and they all drowned, every single one of them. Well, they, the next day, they continued their study of these mice. They put five or six more mice in the tub. The exact same thing happened again. They all died within five, six months, minutes. Well, this is what they started doing in that study. They started pulling these mice out at the four-minute mark. They did this every day. They pulled the mic out, mice out at the four-minute mark. And they continued doing this, lengthening the amount of time the, the mice were in the tub. And, and then if, before long, these mice were able to swim around for an hour and a half. You see, they were dying at five minutes. Now they're swimming for an hour and a half. <coughs> Why? Because they had hope. That's what hope is. They had the hope of being pulled out. That's what God has given us. He's given us hope. We see what the extent he was willing to go upon the cross of Calvary so that we might experience salvation. That warms my heart. And then as we go through life... This hope is increased little by little. You know, just like Abraham. God had promised Abraham a child. It took 25 years before that child would come. But after this child came, God then instructs Abraham, take him to this mountain and sacrifice him. What does Abraham do? He climbs that mountain. He takes Isaac on that mountain and was about to sacrifice him. Why? Because he had hope. He had faith in God. God spent 25 years preparing him to receive Isaac. And so when he instructs him to take Isaac upon that mountain, he also realized there was a, and a promise that was attached to Isaac, that all the blessings of God would flow through him, and a mighty nation would come through Isaac. And so when God instructs him to take Isaac upon this mountain and sacrifice him, God, Abraham just reckoned in his own mind. He reasoned in his own mind. Well, I suppose God is going to raise him from the dead. Because he had this hope. He believed in the promise of God. And that's what Paul goes on to talk about here. He says, not only this, but we exalt in our tribulation. We exalt in tribulation. We exalt in this awesome hope we have of heaven. And that enables us to exalt in tribulation. Because we know that our God causes all things to work together for good. And therefore, we can exult in a tribulation. We know that he loves us because we can see his love upon the cross of Calvary. And he's also promised us the hope of heaven. So whatever we're going through in the here and now, we know that our God loves us. We can look back at the cross. And we know there's a coming good for all of us. That is the hope that we have in heaven. So that enables us to, to exalt in tribulation. That's why James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter these various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce an endurance. And that's what he goes on to talk about. Perseverance. It produces 
a perseverance. I'm able to persevere because through a tribulation because I have the hope of heaven. The, the tribulation I know is good for me because that's what God has promised. He promises to work all things together for good. So whether my house burns down or I lose a loved one or I, I get fired from my job, I know that my God loves me and he's working all things to, together for good. So that enables me to persevere through trials and tribulations. I'm able to press through. And perseverance produces a proven character. I'm able to per persevere. That, that develops a character in me. People can look at and say, Brian, how can you go through this trial, through this tribulation? And I say, because I've got the hope of heaven. And then, then there's this character, you see, is seen in me. This, this character that says that I'm going to persevere. A character is... It's kind of like integrity. It's doing the right thing when no one's looking. But this character is a little bit different than integrity because you can see it in people. You can see in a person that he still has this joy in spite of the trial. You can see that he's able to persevere because of this trial. That's what we see in character. And what does character do? It produces hope. Hope in other people, you see. We're able to persevere. We're able to get through this trial. And it produces a hope in other people. People will start looking at you and say, man, I want what he's got. You know, he's gone through this trial. He's gone through the struggle. And I want what he's got. He's got a hope in him. I want that hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our heart through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's in our hearts. We see this holy this righteous, this loving God, this, this God who's able to span the universe, but yet this same God would come down and go to the cross and die for us. We see his love. We, once we see that love, we, we, we receive that love within us. The Holy Spirit moves in us. Now listen to what he goes on to say. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, time Christ died for the for the for the righteous for the godly no he died for the ungodly at the precise time at the right time it reminds me of what Jesus said ah I didn't mark my Bible but it's in Mark chapter Mark, Mark chapter 1 verse 14 he says behold the kingdom of God is at hand it's at hand. In other words, it's right here. The time has been fulfilled, he said. The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's within your grasp. It's something that you can now lay hold of. See, this is a promise that was made way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God promised Adam to deal with his sin. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And then in Genesis chapter 4, we find Adam, Abraham, I'm sorry, Abel and Cain and Abel at the entrance of the garden are both making sacrifices unto God. Cain was offering God a sacrifice, the work of his hands. In other, in other words, he was rejecting the promise that God had made, saying, God, I know you said you can deal with my sin, but I can deal with this sin myself. Here's the work of my hands. That was man's attitude for millenniums. For millennials, for thousands of years, men were trying to reach God through some sort of religious system. And then finally, God taps, taps Abraham on the shoulder. He says, I'm going to make you a holy nation. And then several hundred years later, he gives Moses the law. In effect, what he was saying through Moses, he said, if you guys really believe that you can approach me through some sort of religious system, then this is what it's going to take. And so he gave Moses the law. You're going to have to keep this law. You're going to have to follow these rules. You're going to have to stay within these guidelines. You're going to have to keep this diet. If you really believe you can reach me through this religious system. See, man had to understand. God gave man the perfect religious system because man had to understand that he could not reach God in his own strength and power. That's why he gave Moses the law. He gave Moses the law in effect saying, you think you can, well, here's what it's going to take. This should convince you that you can't do it. Mark chapter 1, 
we find John the Baptist on the banks of the river. Who was he baptizing? Not the Gentile, but the Jew. Jesus came at the perfect time when man could finally understand that he was completely lost, completely separated from God, unable to reach him through a religious system. Jesus came to save the ungodly. Now, there are still a few bozos out there called the Pharisees that had the pharisaical mentality, well, I'm all that because I keep this religion. You know, I come to church every Sunday. I'm singing praise. I'm giving tithes. I'm taking communion. God's going to bless me because I do these things. There's still a few people that have that attitude, that mentality. God did not come for them. He came to the man who finally understands, who finally realizes that he needs a Savior. Continuing on. He says, For one has, will hardly die for a righteous man. No one's going to die for a righteous man. We'll explain that in just a second. Though perhaps... For the good man, someone might dare die. If you, you know, let's suppose you can barely swim. But you see this man out in a, in a river or in a lake. He's swimming along there. You can barely swim. If you had to, you could swim. If you absolutely had to, you might be able to save someone's life. But you can barely swim. You see this guy swimming. Are you going to dive into the water and save him? No. Because he's able to save himself. Why would I risk my life to save someone else? You see, Jesus is not going to come for a righteous man. He didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die for the Pharisee. He didn't die for the man who believes he can save himself. He died for the unrighteous. He died for... For the godly. He died for the person who can't save himself. That's, that's, that's the idea that Paul's communicating there. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice the word demonstrates. When Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, it was a demonstration of of God's love. It was a demonstration of His grace, of His forgiveness. Him dying on the cross was not necessarily His love. Him dying upon the cross was not His grace. It was a demonstration. He demonstrated His love for us. Why? For again, thousands of years, when, God, when man thought of God, he thought of this angry judge, this cosmic cop, this dictator who was just waiting to throw people into hell. That's how man viewed God. They didn't understand who God is. So God comes and demonstrates it. So this is how much I love you. You see, Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. God's coming out to be with them. He wanted to walk with them. He wanted to talk with them. He wanted to commune with them. Adam, where are you? What was Adam doing? He was hiding himself from God. Because he thought God was ready to kill him now because he had sinned. You see, that's how men viewed God. That he, that he was just angry with them, ready to destroy them. That's his perception of God. God's desire, God's will is to save us. Then the forgiveness was there in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life was there in the Garden. See, when God put Adam and Eve out of the Garden, He put him out so that he could partake of the tree of life, this tree of forgiveness, this tree of grace. See, when we partake of Jesus, when we partake of the sacrifice that He made upon the cross, we're partaking of His grace. God demonstrated His. See how great a love the Father would bestow on us. That we would be called children of God. Can you see His love? You see, until you can see this, and that's what God, you know, man could not receive God's grace and forgiveness until He demonstrated it. And so too, we can't receive it 
We can't partake of it unless we see it, until we fully come to know it. Say, this is the extent God was willing to go to show me his love. You see, when we can see it, we can be partakers of it. God demonstrated it so we could see it. He goes, all right, much more then. Have now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. If God was willing to go to this extent to demonstrate his love upon the cross of Calvary to justify us, don't you know that we have life in him? Not in the things we do, but in him we have life. And not only this, but we exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have been reconciled. We've been reconciled to God. We've been, been brought back into the family of God. He's reconciled us. And not only that, we get to celebrate with Him. He's celebrating with us because He wanted this reconciliation to take place. He wanted this relationship. That's why He would come and die for us. That's why He would come and demonstrate His love. He wants us to be in His presence. He wants us to experience the fullness of all that we have in Christ Jesus. See, we got, we got into our minds that we have to do something to please God in order to experience the riches that we have in Him. We don't do anything. God has done it all. And we can now just stand in His presence and absorb all the riches that we have in Him. Just, now listen to this. Therefore, Justice through one man, through one man, centered in sin entered into the world. Through one man, sin entered into the world. And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Here's what we have in mind. Because Adolf Hitler sinned so badly. Because Jeffrey Dahmer sinned so badly. Because Brian Shear sinned so badly. He was headed for hell. He was, he was headed for eternal death. Because I sinned so badly, I was headed for eternal death. No. I was born... Before I was even born, I was headed for hell. Because one man sinned. You see, we all come from Adam. If Adam had never sinned, we'd still be in paradise. Hypothetically speaking, if he had never sinned, we'd have been born in paradise. We would have been born in heaven. But because one man sinned, we all left paradise. You see, we all became separated from God. We were all born headed for hell because we're born outside of paradise. You see, when Adam sinned, he was put out of paradise and all men left with him. I'm not going to hell because I sinned. Sin is what's keeping me out of heaven, but I'm not going to hell. I'm not born headed for hell because I sinned. No. I was born head, headed to hell because Adam sinned. And Adam was put out of paradise. You see, through one man, all entered into death. Because we all come from Adam. This is a beautiful picture that we're developing here. You've got to understand. We all left paradise through Adam. We all left paradise. We're born headed for hell. Every single one of us. Not because we sinned, but because Adam sinned. Now, the law shows us that we're all sinners. The law shows us that we, we cannot possibly reach God. But we're not born headed to hell because we sinned. We are headed to hell because Adam sinned. You guys hear that? Did I make myself clear? You're right. So we're all headed to hell, right? When we're born. 
Not because we sinned, but because Adam sinned. <laughs> All right. That's, yeah, this is very good news. This is very good news. Hang on. For until the... Listen, 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 listen. <laughs> this is good. This is real good, but For until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. If I'm driving 90 mile an hour down Interstate 55, the state patrolmen's all along that highway, and they're clocking me doing 90, what's going to happen? I'm going to get a ticket. But if I'm in Ger Germany on the Autobahn doing 90 miles per hour, and there's state patrolmen all along the Autobahn, what's going to happen? Nothing. Yeah, I'm going to run over because I'm driving too slow. You see, there's no law in Germany. So there's no sin. There's no law. There's no sin. There was no law from Adam until Moses. There was no law from Adam until Moses. But everyone that died there, not believing in the promise, guess what happened to them? They ended up in hell. There's no law. But, but from Adam until Moses. But if they didn't bring, believe in the promise that was made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, they still ended up in hell. Why? Because they, they were born separated. From, there was only one commandment. Listen to this. There was only one commandment from Genesis until Exodus when the law was given. One commandment. Don't eat from that tree. That's the only commandment that God gave. Don't eat from that tree. And that's what Paul goes on to explain. He said, consider this. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Death was ruling from Adam until Moses. Even for those who did not, had not sinned in the likeness of Adam's offense. What was Adam's offense? Don't eat from that tree. What did Adam do? He ate of that tree. But everyone since Adam has, has gone to hell who did not believe in the promise. There was no law. But they all still end up in hell if they didn't believe in the promise. Death reigned. See, we're not headed for hell because we sinned. We're headed to hell because Adam sinned. The law shows us how impossible it is for us to reach God. The law shows us that we're sinners, but that's not why we're headed for hell. God was simply showing us why we needed a Savior. That's all the law was about. Verse 15, But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did grace of God and the, the, the gift, the gift of life. There was death, but now there's this gift, this gift of life. By the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. One man, because one man's sin, we all go to hell, right? Because of one man's sin, one man's transgression. But we receive the free gift of God, life through one man. This is why Paul says in the book of Corinthians, there's the first Adam, then there's the last Adam. The first Adam, sin entered into the world. Then there's the last Adam. Praise God, that we receive a free gift of life. Listen to what he goes on to say. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from the many transgressions, resulting in trans justification. For if by the, by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, death reigned through Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, Jesus, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. There's the first Adam, as Paul describes him, and then there's the last Adam. We don't get to heaven by the things we do. We didn't, we don't, we're not going to hell because of anything we did. Nor are we going to heaven because of anything we do. 
We, we go to heaven because there's the first Adam and then there's the last Adam. We go to heaven through the last Adam, through Jesus Christ. That's the only reason we're going to heaven. Not because, thank God, praise God, we don't do anything. Amen. We just get on the train. We get on the train. Listen to this. Listen to this. Oh, this is good stuff. He says, okay, 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 let me find it. <laughs> okay, okay. Verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. His will is that we all go to heaven. And we've been predestined to heaven. But guess what? Before we were predestined to heaven, we were predestined for hell. The moment we were born, we were predestined for hell. But we can be, if we make the choice, to be predestined for heaven. There's a train. It's called the first Adam. It's left St. Louis. It's stopping in Dyersburg, and it's on its way to Dallas. It's called the first Adam. Now, if I want to... If I want to go to St. Louis, but I'm already headed to Dallas, what must I do? I must get on a, a train that's headed back to St. Louis. So I've got to make a transfer here in Dyersburg from, the, from, the, from the, the first atom to the last atom. You see, this is the train that takes us to heaven. We're on a train. We're predestined for hell. In order to get to, on the train that's going to heaven, we must... Get on that train that's headed for heaven, the last Adam, if you will. Listen to what Paul goes on to say. So then, through, through the trans, one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through the act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. So there's one transgression. And we're, say, we're, we're headed to hell because of that one transgression. And through the, the result of of righteousness of one were headed to heaven. For as though, or I'm sorry, for as through the one man's disobedience, one man's disobedience, who's? First Adam, right? One man's disobedience. There were many sinners made. Even so, through the obedience of one, who is that one? Jesus, the last Adam. The one, the, the many were made righteous. You're not chosen to go to heaven. Not a single one of us are chosen to go to heaven. Hear me out. I know that goes against the grain of many teachings. We're not chosen to go to heaven. There was only one who was chosen. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the only one the Father's pleased in. But we can move in to Christ by simply believing. Master, how can we do the works of God? What did he say? Go to church, take, give tithe, take communion, sing praise songs. No, that's not what he said. Master, how can we do the works of God? Believe in the one the Father has sent. We believe in him. We move into him. We're on the last Adam headed for heaven. This, 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 is, this is awesome, guys, if you think this through. We don't do anything. But believe. Believe in Jesus Christ. That's how we get to heaven. Period. There's nothing we do. There's nothing we can do. That's what the law shows us. You can't do anything. None of you can be found righteous. Not a single one of you. Only Jesus. This is my beloved son. This is the one I'm pleased in. Through the one, we get back to heaven. The law came in so the transgression would be increased. So the whole purpose of the law was to show us, hey, you're a sinner. You can't go to heaven. And the more the law revealed, the more sin I realized I had. That's still happening today. As I study Scripture, I see the law. I said, man, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. But that doesn't change a thing. Because I'm in Christ. So through the law, transgression increased. The law shows us that we're dirty, rotten scoundrels headed for hell. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. 
<laughs> because the more you realize how much you sin, the more you realize how much grace you've been showed. And the more I realize how much grace I've been showed, you know what happens? I can't help but love him. I can't help but give my heart to him. Because he's loved me so much. This is why John says, confess your sins, knowing that he is faithful and righteous to forgive you, knowing that you're already forgiven. Just admit that sin. And the more I admit that sin, the more I love him. The more I seek him, the more I find him. The more I find him, the more I love him. The more I love him, the more I seek him. It's just it's this endless cycle. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have life because he was righteous. Amen? Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for the life that you've given to us freely. Lord, I just pray that everyone's received that life. They're experiencing that life in Christ Jesus. Amen.